In the previous module, we've seen how biography can be used for political purposes, how it can be used for validating particular political perspectives, how it can support a regime, how it can undermine or reinforce morality. What I want to indicate is that very similar processes go on when we look at the way that biography and science have intersected. What I'm going to do first off is have a brief look at a man with whom I'm very familiar, Charles Bell, who lived in the early part of the 19th century. And I'm going to look at a portrayal of Bell that was produced in the 1830s. And this will demonstrate quite clearly how biographical portraits can be used for particular ends, in this instance, professional ends. Charles Bell was an extraordinary figure who made many breakthroughs in uh, uncovering the structure and functions of the nervous system. Scottish by birth, Bell had come down to London to make a name for himself. He bought the Hunter's old anatomy school a Great Windmill Street Theatre. There he not only taught a generation of medical students, he also conducted experiments that led to many discoveries in the nervous system. Despite his Scottish background, he was an Episcopalian, that is, a follower of the Anglican path. As such, he was an ardent believer in the idea of a designed universe, the watchmaker, a Paley. Often in his lectures, he would point out to the complexity of human design and use it as proof that a God existed. At that time, the medical elite was dominated by individuals who believed the same sort of thing. And Bell fitted in really well with them. However, it was also a time when the general practitioner was becoming a more and more important figure within the medical profession. This new class of individual had started to challenge the old elites. At the forefront of this was Thomas Wackley, who founded the campaigning journal The Lancet, first published in 1823, the political program of which was the democratisation of medicine. Figures of Bell's background became the principal target of Wackley's Lancet. But Bell himself seemed to be immune from these attacks because of the breakthroughs that he had made in science. Bell, the scientist, was held up as everything that was progressive about the dreams of the medical reformers. In 1833, Wackley published in The Lancet a memoir, or rather a short biography, of Bell's life in Edinburgh and in London. In it, he noted the trials and tribulations that Bell had faced and the magnitude of the discoveries that he had made. Wackley singled out as opponents to Bell's ideas the elite surgeons who Wackley had satirically named the Bats. Will it be believed, Wackley wrote, that the lecturing bats of this metropolis have omitted on almost all occasions to notice in terms of commendation the brilliant discoveries of this physiologist. Wackley finished with a flourish. No matter that in reality, Bell himself was one of those bats. Written in 1833, this memoir of Bell serves as a template for the way that scientists are often written about. It's not so much trying to uncover their real lives or make the real Charles Bell or whoever stand up as to demonstrate issues around the progress of science and sometimes to challenge the nature of scientific practice, particularly when the individual has made a breakthrough that somehow has shifted a paradigm a breakthrough that is often resisted by the more fuddy-duddy members 
of the profession. In this form of scientific biography, we see a hero standing up against the orthodoxies of the day, standing up against the political structures of the day, and eventually triumphing, often a great personal cost to themselves. The scientific biography is cut out of the mould of Carlyle's heroes. It is shaped from the very same cloth. It uses the same view of history. It relies heavily upon the notion of genius, the genius of one man and sometimes one woman standing up against the orthodoxies of their more staid, less adventurous and less intellectually gifted of their colleagues. For a long time, the vast majority of history that was written was the history of great men in political circumstances. While this was the case, history and biography got along perfectly well. It was also a very convenient model for the history of science. In fact, in both history and medicine, the standard historical view was a biographical view, looking at the great heroes overcoming all the odds. But during the 1950s and 1960s, a new type of history emerged, social history, which focused not on the workings of great men, but on the way ordinary people lived and how ordinary people had shaped society. Historians like Christopher Hill and E.P. Thompson started applying Marxist theory to history, started trying to uncover the lived experience of ordinary men and women. This was an explicit rejection of the history of great men, and it also downgraded the status of biography. Biography, where it was to be practised, was done so, historians believed, in the most simple manner, making it barely worthy of consideration as a method. This is the social historian J.F.C. Harrison being rather dismissive about the use a biography in social history. Biography, although not without its own special problems, is by and large one of the simpler ways of writing history. The lifespan of the biography provides a firm structure and his career and interests solve many knotty problems of themes and chronology, ideology and event of individual and society. In other words, biography was just really join the dots history. Up until the 1960s, the vast majority of history of science had been produced by scientists. They obviously had a great deal of interest in promoting their disciplines and highlighting the heroic nature of the people that had made the major breakthroughs. But in tandem with the emergence of social history, a new history of science emerged, a professional history of science, a history of science located in academic departments outside of the science faculty, often in a social science faculty or an arts faculty. Take, for example, the case of Francis Bacon, an individual who was once worshipped as the founder of modern science, the individual who came up with the methodology that underwrote the development of scientific knowledge. We'd always assumed that this was because Bacon was a pretty smart fella, that he was a genius, that he had come up with these ideas, maybe standing on the shoulders of giants, but pretty much off his own bat. He's an original, a one of a kind. Now, social construction as it emerged in the 1970s put forward the idea that knowledge was a direct product of social relations and circumstances. And we can see this in the essay that Page Dubois wrote about Francis Bacon, emotively entitled Subjective Bodies, Science and the State, Francis Bacon, Torturer. Yes, it pretty much says what it's going to do in the title. Now we know that Francis Bacon wasn't just a thinker about science, the man who produced the work the great instauration that did so much to reformulate the scientific method. 
Bacon also happened to be the Lord Chancellor of England. This meant that he was a servant of the crown, a servant of the king, and one of his jobs was to maintain social order in the kingdom. And he had to do this by preventing the enemies of the state from undermining the power of the monarchy. And of course, this wasn't some kind of pie-in-the-sky thing. We're only a few years after the gunpowder plot at this time, when Guy Fawkes and a number of other conspirators had attempted to blow up the Houses of Parliament with King James the I and VI in them. However, they had been foiled in their attempt to assassinate the monarch and bring back Catholicism into the kingdom. Bacon, in protecting the state, had the role of extracting information out of his political enemies. And this involved a range of different forms of torture, including what we see here, the rack, where people were stretched and stretched and stretched until they admitted their guilt to whatever crime they were being accused of. Now, Dubois maintained that it was his role of Lord Chancellor that made him relook at nature, that made him, in effect, a torturer of nature, that developed a methodology that would allow him to subject nature to his reason. Without his role as torturer, he would have been unable to develop his ideas about the experimental method. Pesic and Henry, in recent years, they have refuted Dubois, but still managed to maintain the older model of social construction. Henry, in particular, maintains that Bacon's ideas emerged out of his religious views, particularly his views about the role of the church in the state. Ironically, the new history allowed for the revitalising of biography. It provided the opportunity to demonstrate how scientific discoverers were shaped by the forces of their time. No longer would they be regarded as lone geniuses operating on another planet. Now they would be the highly effective synthesizers of the forces, the tenor of their times. And as we'll see, not everybody liked this particular way of thinking about it. Indeed, during the 1990s, a period famous for the science or culture wars, where people involved in the social studies of science fought against scientific warriors who hated the kind of things that they were doing, hated the idea that people like Darwin or Pasteur would be downgraded by the new theory. Louis Pasteur, hero of science, discoverer of microorganisms that cause fermentation and also illness as pathogens. A man who was responsible for developing treatments, vaccines for the deadly disease anthrax, a theory that allowed for the emergence of antiseptic surgery, thus cutting the huge amounts of post-operative infection and death. In every sense, Pasteur was a hero of science, and not just a hero of science, he was a hero of France, a symbol of French national pride and progress. But our view of Pasteur was radically changed when Giessen published his book, The Private Science of Louis Pasteur, in 1995. It wasn't that Giessen did not think that Pasteur was a great scientist, not at all. He was quite clearly in admiration of Pasteur's work. To be sure, he revealed that at times Pasteur had to work incredibly hard to prove what it was that he wanted to prove. Um, his experiments had to be tweaked and tuned until the right results were delivered. But one of the really big revelations was the correlation between Pasteur's private religious views and his attempt to demonstrate that processes like fermentation were not driven by spontaneous generation. Spontaneous generation was the idea that matter could be created out of nothing, spontaneously, without the need for any creator. 
This ran contrary to Pasteur's deep Catholic beliefs. Spontaneous generation negated the need for God. So Pasteur set out to prove that spontaneous generation did not occur. And this was the basis of his attempts to demonstrate small microorganisms that were integral to the process of fermentation and further acted as pathogens in the case of infectious diseases. As a historian of science, steeped in the methods of the history of science, its new epistemology that had emerged during the 1960s and 1970s, this was geese and stock in trade. There seemed nothing particularly radical from his perspective in suggesting that there had been social or in this instance religious pressures that had shaped the research that Pasteur had undertaken. Neither was there anything radical in him suggesting that somehow he went out looking for what he eventually found. But the 1990s were a time when people in science studies and historians of science, historians of medicine, seemed to be in a permanent state of warfare with scientists themselves who thought that the kind of views put forward by Giessen and many other people were relativist, undermined the basic methodology and ideas behind science. A book like The Private Science of Louis Pasteur was deeply threatening to individuals like Max Perutz. Perutz was one of the foremost molecular biologists of his day, a Nobel Prize winner in 1962 for his work on the structure of haemoglobin. The prestigious New York Review of Books asked Perutz to review Giessen's work. The result was not pretty. This gives a flavour of Perutz's deeply held views and how upset Giessen's work had made him. Toppling great men from their toppling great men from their pedestals, sometimes on the slenderest of evidence, has become a fashionable and lucrative industry, and a safe one, since they cannot sue because they are dead. Giessen is in good company, but he, rather than Pasteur, seems to me guilty of unethical and unsavoury conduct when he burrows through Pasteur's notebooks for scraps of supposed wrongdoing and then inflates these out of all proportion in order to drag Pasteur down. In fact, his evidence is contrived and does not survive scientific examination. Pasteur would not be alone in being reassessed by a new generation of biographers using the tools of the social studies of science and the history of science. Darwin, too, would be on the receiving end of treatment by revisionist biographers, and we'll turn to this in the next module.